Very good. All right. Well, we continue today in our sermon series that we started last week um, about healthy living. We're talking about how to be healthy in our souls. And uh, we hear a lot, of course, in our world today about how to be healthy in our bodies. And that's very important. Nothing wrong with that. But what does it mean to be healthy in our inner life, in our very soul? Well, last week we talked about how that starts. The, the journey of spiritual health begins with repentance, being saved by grace, baptism. And so today I want to build on that and talk about another factor in living a healthy spiritual life, and that is facing what I call gospel disinformation. Fake news about the gospel. See, we need to be clear both individually and as a church on what the gospel really is. Because if you don't know the full gospel of Jesus Christ, you can get into a lot of trouble. And I want to make sure that you individually and that our church lives and breathes out of the true gospel since there is all of this disinformation and misinformation out there. In fact, the Bible speaks very clearly on this issue. In fact, Paul himself had to deal with a church, or actually many churches, in the, the, the province of Galatia in the Roman Empire that was dealing with fake gospel. And he gives it to them straight. There's no fluff with Paul. So I'd invite you to read with me in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6 and reading through verse 12, dealing with gospel disinformation. Now, if you can picture in your brain, as we read this, Paul being a little red-faced. He's getting right down to business on this. He says this, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are dis disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, I'll say it again. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. For, I am now see for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from a man, nor I, was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Tell us what you really think, Paul. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this great uh, text that we have in front of us today and the great reminders that we've had in worship this morning that you are sovereign God and that you've called us with a higher calling to holy living, set apart for you, based not on works and how perfect we are, but based on grace. Help us to capture the spirit of this great message, this great text that Paul has delivered to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul is landing some serious right hooks in this text, isn't he? He reminds me here of some of my baseball coaches that I had growing up after a loss, they got red-faced. There may or may not have been some lockers smashed. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all are kind of like, I think so. <laughs> but why would, Paul, why would Paul get so riled up? 
You know, sometimes Paul, do, Paul doesn't get too riled up, except in some very specific circumstances that we see in the New Testament, all of which are revolving around the integrity of the gospel. If you want to get Paul mad, it takes a lot, but when Paul gets riled up, it's always about the gospel of Christ and nothing else. Now, why would Paul then get so mad because the integrity of the gospel was at stake? Well, there were some people who followed Paul around, and after he would minister a while at some of these churches, this was a group called the Judaizers, they would follow Paul and try to confuse people. They would say, Paul has it half right. They would say, Jesus is the real Messiah. You can trust in him and be saved. But, they would say, you also need to follow the Old Testament laws. You also need to follow all of the sacrificial system. You need Jesus and the Ten Commandments for God really to save you. They would say that. You need Jesus and circumcision. You need Jesus and the sacrificial system. You need Jesus and to make sure you sit in the exact same pew always on Sunday morning. You need Jesus and to wear a certain brand of clothing. You need Jesus and to vote the right way. You need Jesus and to tweet the right tweets. It's always Jesus and something. Jesus and something. And there's a technical word for this. It's called legalism. Ever heard that word? Let me define legalism for you. Hello. Legalism is the devil's gospel. It's the idea that you have to be saved through a code, through an ordinance, through a theory, through a dogma, through a system of law, or a series of transactions that gets God to like you better. And make no mistake, this is the devil's religion. It's the religion of the world that says, do this and you'll be saved. Tweet this and God will like you more. Say this, and you <laughs> I had a kid over here said, tweet, tweet. Great metaphor. We'll take it. Good sound effects today. Get up on stage and entertain people, and God will love you for that. Say a mystical formula, a mystical prayer, and you'll truly be saved. Pay the preacher tw on TV $20 a month for your seed of faith, and you will receive the blessing. That's legalism. Vote for this particular political candidate with this particular political party, and God really will smile on you. That's legalism. It's a religion based on pride. Because if you can do certain things good enough and perfect enough, then you are supposedly a better person, better liked by the Lord. And that's horrible. The reason it's horrible is that there are so many people out there today, even Christians, who have absolutely blown it. They have made a mess of their lives and they think that God has kicked them out and that the church hates them and they have no hope in their future because they just couldn't get a few steps right to be correct enough for God and the church. And I mourn that. There are undoubtedly families within a stone's throw of this church who may never step foot in a church facility again because they've been told a gospel that says it's Jesus and doing certain things good enough for us. It happened in the first century. 
It happens today. But here's where it gets good. There is a cure to the cancer of legalism. It is a cancer that once it gets in the body, it can wreak havoc and it metastasizes quickly, but there is a cure for it. You can get inoculated to legalism. And the the cure is found in this text. Paul lays it out to us straight. So what I want to do in my remaining time today is to tell you some truths, some principles of this scripture that will help cure you individually and any church body of legalism. Number one, number one, false gospels have bells and whistles. Let me frame that another way. False gospels, fake gospels, are attractional, but they are not transformational. Paul says it like this. He says, I am amazed. We would say, you're blowing my mind. I don't understand this, that you are deserting the one who called you by grace for a different gospel. I'm amazed by that. Paul, in other words, is floored with the way that this false gospel has so rapidly attracted and carried off the allegiance of the people in these Galatian churches. It was a shiny gospel. It had a lot of bells and whistles. In fact, here we go. I bet their worship services were something to see. I bet they had services with the smoke coming off the stage. Woo! I bet their their services were timed right down to 59 minutes and 30 seconds because they had to be perfect. No room for the spirit there. I bet they had to control every aspect of church life. I bet they had the best produced YouTube videos. I bet they had a $10 million budget. I bet all the musicians on stage and the preacher had the skinny jeans and the Gucci. Woo! I'm never wearing skinny jeans. You don't want to see them. Oh, I bet the production was slick. And I bet this church was busting at the seams with people because it was so slick. It was so slick. But friends, all that glitters ain't gold. Because guess what this attractive, shiny gospel was doing to these people? Paul says that they were deserting Christ. The word actually there is committing treason. They were turning their backs on Jesus. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You may have the shiniest house, the finest china plates, gold forks and spoons, an Olympic-sized pool in your backyard, but if your house is built on sand, when that storm comes, great is its fall. See, we were told in Hebrews 9, the passage we read just a moment ago, that Christ's blood purges the law. See, Christ died on that cross, and when he did so, he did so in your place, and he fulfilled the law. There's nothing that you and I can do to earn right relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing. The door is open for you to come to Christ as you are no matter who you are. You don't have to be good enough 
because Jesus is good enough. All you have to do to be saved is receive his grace. And yeah, that's not fancy. There's no glitter to it. That's not how it works in the world. But when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, that meant that our salvation is totally 100% taken care of. Isn't that good? And the Bible says, whosoever will may come. And when the Bible says whosoever, that means whosoever. Drug drug addict, thug, rich, poor, lives in a big mansion, homeless, Democrat, Republican, depressed, happy. You don't have to turn tail and run to legalism. Run to Christ. He is the rock. And when your life is on the rock, no arrow of Satan can touch you. There's no safer place in a flood than the high ground of the rock. That rock is Jesus. And friends, when you share the gospel outside these walls, make sure that people know it's all about God's grace. Make sure to share with people that we are all broken sinners because of the cross. And we're not saved because of anything that we've done. In fact, many of us are saved in spite of what we've done. We don't need a church built on attractions. Leave that to amusement parks. We need to be built on the transformational grace of the the Lord Jesus Christ. And when everybody else may turn tail and run, to whatever is shiny and whatever is legalistic. You stay on the rock. You stay strong. Stand on grace. And when somebody says, well, you have to be perfect, you say, no, I don't. <laughs> because I serve a perfect Savior. My gospel doesn't have bells and whistles. as Jesus. Number two. Actually, number three on the screen. Didn't mean to confuse you. False gospels are scams. Y'all are quiet today. (laughs) False gospels are scams. Verse 7, Paul says that this is not just another account. This is not just another interpretation. This is not just another, what the Judaizers are doing. It's not just another way of looking at things. This is not... Baptist doctrine versus Methodist doctrine. We have some things that are different, but we're at the core. We claim Jesus is Lord. He's not talking about that sort of thing. Paul is talking about the fact that it's incumbent upon each and every Christian to pay strict attention to what you read and what you hear. And what you read and what you hear needs to be filtered through the gospel in your mind and in your heart. Let me put it in a blunter way that Paul does. If you ever hear or read from a preacher, even me, okay, even me, a preacher, a pastor, a priest, a popular Christian author, anyone, if they, me, whoever it is, is promoting legalism, That is false. That's false. And if you don't hear the gospel in anything that's being said, run. It's a scam. Legalists are out to push you in bondage to their way of thinking. Control, power. That's not grace. Legalism is spiritual slavery. Now, let me get really specific because there are some things out there today that are promoted that sound gospel-y, 
but they're not really gospel. For instance, what if, what if, let's just play a what if game real quick. What if I got up here on Sundays and began to teach a gospel of humanism mixed in with a little Christianity? What if I said things like, you do what's absolutely best for you, and Christ will smile on that? See, the problem with that is that if you're living your best life, that may be totally rooted in your flesh. And so you'll seek to gain this great life through selfish plans instead of submitting to Christ. Your best life is lived when God's grace frees you to live obediently to him. Not when you're just doing your own thing and getting Jesus to smile on you. Doing God's will is living your best life. It's not a program. Or what if I got up here and taught something like a synthesized, uh, I'll call it Christian Buddhism. This is very popular right now in Austin. Ours is a kind of a new agey kind of city, isn't it? Which looks attractive on the outside, but it's corrupt on the inside. For instance, I could get up here and say, you know, you just need to abandon all th- just, just let it go, let it go, and you will achieve nirvana. You didn't know Frozen was Buddhist, did you? What if I got up here and said, you know, there's really no such thing as truth. Everything is just a principle, and that will lead us to eternal life. That may sound appealing to some, but that's legalism. This, this new agey stuff that we hear all the time in Austin, the, the stuff that keeps us weird, you know? Here's the dirty little secret about it. That stuff doesn't lead to life. It leads to your extinction. Buddhistic uh, new age theology says... I have come that you may be extinct and find nirvana. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I'd rather have Jesus than the new agey stuff. Next point. Preaching a false gospel comes with a heavy price. Preaching a cheap gospel ain't really cheap. In fact, Paul very bluntly, very clearly says that if someone is proclaiming a gospel that's false and legalistic, he says, let them be a curse. The Greek word is anathema. Now, let me tell you what that means because it makes a preacher like me sit up straight. Teaching like this from Paul makes me quake in my boots. (laughs) And here's why. As a pastor, and those of you who are teachers, Sunday school teachers, we are held accountable to God by what we say about him. And Paul teaches that if we deviate from the true gospel message, here's what anathema means. It's better for us not to exist. Yikes. You mean that's in the Bible? Yeah, that's what Paul said. Now, will there be some times that we may not get our theology and doctrine all correct? Absolutely. Does God forgive us for that? Absolutely. Are we fallible people? Yes, absolutely. But if we intentionally turn ourselves away from the gospel in order to attract attention and popularity, The church is not worth the plot of ground on which it stands. Which leads me to this. I want us to be all on the same page on this one. What is exactly the real true gospel? Here it is. 
let's start with a biblical statement. Every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have missed the target. We have perverted that which is good. And there's no way that we can heal ourselves. Sin has separated us from God, and therefore we need divine help to get back into relationship with him. But how do we do that if we can't in our own power? God has a redemptive plan. His plan is for us not to earn back through our own effort what we have lost. His plan is not for you to solve some riddle or to achieve some right relationship through your good works. His plan was to come in the flesh and die for you on the cross in your place to atone for your sin. And the atonement could only be made through the shedding of his blood on the cross. His blood purges and nullifies sin. God then is a seeking God. He wants to be in right relationship with each and every one of us, and he calls us and he draws us by his spirit to receive forgiveness and grace. And when we do that, we are reconciled with him. And his grace compels obedience. Obedience does not compel grace. You don't achieve salvation. Jesus did. And then he rose from the dead. He conquered sin on the cross. And because he did that, he was able to conquer death in the grave. We never curry enough favor to get in right relationship with him. The only thing available for us is to receive the free gift of grace. And when we lay down our arms against Christ, he forgives. We are justified. We are made right with him. We are reconciled with him. And our souls are regenerated, born again. And life becomes worth living, not because of what we can get out of it, but because of what Christ has put into it. That's good news, friends. Oh, that's good. Have you responded to the gospel? And if so, are you proclaiming it? Don't give in to legalism. It may have all the bells and whistles, but it doesn't transform. It may sound good on the surface, but it'll enslave you like a scam. Preaching those fake gospels has a heavy price that we can't pay. But receiving God's grace brings life eternal and abundant and free. Respond to the good news of Christ and you will, you will be spiritually 